executives need to say so little. Like they shouldn't, they should say more. But I'll just tell you a quick story. I was coaching the executive team of a big American bank as the mm. bank was undergoing a multi-year agile transformation. And after a few months of this, we had one we had a coaching meeting with with the team, and the president, immediately following our coaching session, had a meeting with his direct reports, and he said three words to that organization after coming out of our meeting. He said, "He said, agile is hard," and our email and our text messages just started blowing up. Like, oh my God, you reached him. He gets us. He understands us. Right? Finally, finally, he understands what we've been going through. Right? He literally said three words, that tiny speck of humility and accountability, whatever you want to call it, triggered such a visceral and tangible response in all of his direct reports. But that's that's all it takes is an admission that this stuff is hard, that it's unpredictable, it's complex, we're going to make mistakes. Let's figure that out sooner rather than later so that we don't build too much or hire too much or or sell too much and course correct, right? Course correction based on evidence is the goal, right? That's agility. And if we can build that mindset into our organization, we will win. Get ready for the Product Tea with Leah, your fun-sized dose of business, tech, growth, and product chatter. I'm your host, Leah, and it's time to spill the tea. Welcome to the Product Tea, everyone. Today, with a design and agile philosopher who has been helping to shape the web since the days of dial up. He wrote Lean UX, Sense and Respond, and Lean versus Agile versus Design Thinking. He's the go to guy for making the complex seem simple. And when he's not revolutionizing the digital world, he's a proud dad, cat owner, and searching for that elusive, perfect exorcist joke. So buckle up for insights from the man who's forever employable and teaching others how to be the same. Welcome, Jeff Gotthelf. It's a pleasure to be here since the days of dial-up, Leah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm at the same age, by the way, right? So it's kind of fine. How would you rate this introduction from zero to fully-fledged outcome-driven 10? I think this one goes to 11. If we're going to date ourselves, we might as well just fully just go all out. It goes to 11. Well, thank you very much. That is the correct minimal answer that I was expecting. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself in one or two sentences to the people who are still stuck in Waterfall? <laughs> if you're stuck in Waterfall, sure, I used to be just like you. And no, uh, oh. the, look, the reality, who am I? I'm a designer turned product manager turned entrepreneur turned consultant. That's the story of the career. The focus has always been putting the customer front and center in the conversation, regardless of what I was doing. And the reality is that the nature of digital products and services today means that we can do that, right? But we have to choose to do that. And all of these tools and processes and ways of working and buzzwords that we've been hearing for the last 20 years, agile and lean startup and design thinking and lean UX and product discovery and OKRs and all these things, they are steps towards doing that. They all share a common theme, which is putting the customer front and center and building great products that meet the needs of real people. And that's what I help companies do. Yeah. So you're the guy for uh, reminding people that they're selling to actual customers and not just robots. That's pretty good. I think you can live with that. Okay. Yeah, humans. Cool. So let's just start with the first question that I ask everyone. What do people get wrong about you once they get to know you? Yeah, this is really interesting. It's a fantastic question and no one's ever asked me that. And I've been having this conversation with my family recently People seem to think that I'm mean after they get to know me or like grumpy, you know, like grumpy. And yeah. and it's funny because I don't perceive myself that way. I feel like I've got a smile on my face 80% of the time. And, but for some reason, my kids' friends, and to be clear, these are teenagers and, you know, 17, 18 year old kids, they think that I'm mean and grumpy. And some of my oldest friends occasionally are like, oh, there's Jeff being grumpy again. I don't know why people think that, I, but that's totally wrong. I'm not mean. I'm not grumpy. I'm not angry. I'm super. I'm always like this. Do you think so? Like, there's the stereotype of the old person sitting on a bench, like complaining about teenagers and all that stuff, right? Like, you know that me. Like, you know that stereotype, yeah, right? Sure. Yeah. Do you actually think that all of these people don't? They don't even perceive themselves as grumpy. Is that what it is? Like, we're getting older and we just completely forget how we come across to the world. I hope not. <laughs> Right, yeah. right. I hope to be a little bit more self-aware than that. But I think at some point, yeah, I think at some point we just don't notice that we're just kind of like annoyed 
by the world, <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not annoyed by the world. I'm, I'm, I love the world, generally oh, speaking. Oh, I am. I am. I'm very annoyed about the world, but I also have an RBF. So, you know, like that's probably why I'm coming across this way, the way that I do. So let's not spell this out. That's fine. Is there anything that you are afraid of right now in your professional or personal life? Professionally, I always fear sort of the overreaction and the over-indexing on the shiny new thing. And so right now it's AI, right? Everything has AI. We have to over-index on AI. You know what I'd love for companies to over-index on? stability, <laughs> reliability of their products. That would be amazing before you throw AI. Like for example, I use this amazing email client. I love it. It's called Spark. Spark Mail. It's made in Ukraine. I pay them money for it. I love supporting them, right? The whole thing. And I, I really love a lot of the features on there. And they threw AI in there. And it's a worthless feature. Like no one's, you're not going to be able to answer my emails for me, right? In any kind of compelling way. But you know what I'd love to see more invested in the product is reliability because <laughs> it keeps crashing, right? That's yep. where I'd love to see. And so that's what scares me. It scares me that companies over-index on the shiny new thing. That's not to say that AI isn't tempting. It's not fascinating. It's not, if it solves a real need in a compelling new way, fantastic. Let's include it. But that's what scares me is that we pull all these resources it's kind of like Facebook was like, we're doing video, right? And so everybody switched to video and fired all their reporters. And then video didn't work, so they fired all the video people. And so let's just just take, it, take a breath before we jump into this pool. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. There was a very good study that was done by uh, Paddle and OpenView together where they were talking about if a company started to add AI to their products, what kind of made them successful or unsuccessful? You know, like, did it work or did it not work? Because everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. We have been, I don't know how old is ChatGPT now, like six months, nine months? I, I don't remember yeah. anything. Like, you could release this kind of year, right? And the interesting thing is, and this is also how I conceptually advise companies on this, if you think about AI and you start to bring it into your company, and this does not trigger a discussion about whether you should change your pricing, so the value of your product in any way, then you should not do it in the first place. Interesting. And I think that has been, it sounds very smart. And I think it is smart, <laughs> at least to some degree, because if you really think that it's going to do something for your customers for real, then you should also charge more for your product. That's Otherwise right. you should not do it. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, like I think you said something really interesting. And this is about, it goes a little bit into the direction of what you're talking about a lot, like OKRs and, you know, like outcome-driven development, like we want to do something for the customer. We really want to move in a direction that works for them. It is interesting when we start to bring in stuff like AI that at the same time is deteriorating absolute table stakes. So a good example would be we have started to add features to our plane, but it just crashes now a little bit more. Right. And that's kind of problematic. So... If we now steer the discussion towards this, how do you think about preventing organizations that are a little bit more mature? So we're not talking about the five people startup, we're talking about 50 people or bigger. How can they use any methodology or like any process? It's not just like from a first principles thinking, how can they make sure that they're not diluting important table stakes for the customers? As you said, you know, like for instance, stability or whatever, so how can they bring this into their organization? How do you think about that? The best way to do it is to always ask yourself, what problem are we solving next, right? What's the next problem we're solving for customers? I guarantee you that none of your customers' problems are lack of AI, right? Like your customers didn't, didn't, aren't like, God, I wish Riverside.fm had AI. That would make it better, right? That's not my problem, right? Like think about what is the problem that you're solving for your customers. now. If that's a real problem and it's meaningful enough to your customers to make a difference to them and to your organization, and AI is one possible way to solve it, terrific. Test that out, figure it out. But always starting from the problem that you're solving rather than the solution that you're looking to implement, right? It, 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 we're back in this arms race, right? Well, they have it, so we have it, so they have it, so we have to have it, right? Is it working for them? Is it making their customers more successful? Is it making them more money? right? Why do we have to have it if it doesn't add any value to it? Are yeah. we losing customers because we don't have it? I think that that's the key. So what, what is the problem that we're, the real problem that we're solving for our real customers? 
that would make a difference for them. And then let's figure out how to solve it. I think from a first principles perspective, I would agree to this. I think a good point that you also mentioned is, is that if you're not 100% sure that what your competition added, which probably triggered your entire FOMO of adding it to the product, you can do research on your competitors' customers, right? Like this is sometimes also like a bewildering concept to a lot of people. Yeah. And I'm not talking about shadow buying. I'm talking about really trying to get, especially if you talk about bigger customers, like how is Notion doing it? Or how is Instagram serving its customers? Depending on who your competitor is, you will find their customers and you can talk to them also relatively honestly. And I think you made a very good point about this. Unless they are absolutely in love with it. And that's the reason why they're really staying with it. And it's very hard to actually find people who can use and leverage AI productively in their environment. Then you should really question whether this should make it or not. But I do make a point though, when it comes to efficiency, there is something there about AI that we have to question. And then we also have to kind of figure out, specifically, I was talking to a startup in Sao Paulo that was starting to enable lawyers to use AI to draft documents, right? So like the typical, you know, like litigation templates and that kind of stuff. Sure. And in that case, it was very interesting because it kind of worked. One of the key problems that we have when we at least interview customers on why AI does not make that big of an effect, then it is usually the last quality step. It's just, it's always like 80%. Right? Like, so one of the reasons why you and me have a conversation and then not lay out the AI bot, it's just not good enough, right? Like right. it's just not good enough. But I think if you start to put the human at the end and use AI at the moment for a draft solution that is then like being qualified and has some actual QA at the end, then I think it can work also for bigger companies. Yeah. But this is very important and, and difficult to put into a context, yeah. So there's two things there to react to. So the first thing that you said was talk to your competitors, customers. And I agree. I think it's a mind blowing concept for a lot of folks. And I don't understand why, right? Like they're not off limits, right? Go find out why they use your competitor and why they love it or hate it or what's working for them. There's absolutely no reason why you can't do that. It's, it's not illegal. <laughs> it's not unfair. It's a total, it's, it's competitive research, right? That's part of being a product manager. The other thing, I also, I agree that I think that from a zero to get me started perspective, that's a huge, one of the hugest benefits I'm seeing lately from AI, right? I don't need to start from a blank screen. I don't even need to start from a template. I can just say, look, I need a template that has these components in it that usually works well for this type of situation. Start that. That gets me from zero to 50%, right, instantly. And then I can spend my time doing the parts that humans are particularly good at, right? And so uh, I love that. And I've used that actually in a legal situation as well, where I needed a, I'm a one-person company. And I had a client who requested a disaster recovery plan from oh. me, right? They're a corporate client. They request that out of all their vendors. You know, I work in the Google suite of products. Like my disaster recovery plan is Google, right? But that wasn't the cloud, but that wasn't good enough, right? They, need, they needed something in writing. So, you know, I, I went to chat GPT and I was like, please write 10 bullet points on disaster recovery for a small one to five person company and just get me started. And that got me from zero to 90% in five minutes. And then my lawyer took a look and tweaked a couple of things and, you know, saved me a thousand dollars and everyone was happy. I think that's a very good point because I just noticed that a lot of people say that, you know, like it's BS in and BS out, right? Like in regards to these language models. I think if you are dealing with bullshit processes in companies, specifically enterprises, you know, like you need to have this kind of side. Of the, you all just, I mean, you know that, that never anything will ever happen, but because of compliance, they kind of need to have it. Yeah. This goes a little bit in line also with uh, reference letters you know, like uh, when you need to apply to a specific position and so forth. Yeah. And I just read an article where they said that, you know, AI reference letters to, or like up to applications for jobs are becoming indistinguishable from actual written ones. <laughs> and this is, I think this is more of a testament to how much bullshit they usually are. Yeah. And I think this makes them probably go away, right? Like it kind of gets rid of this unnecessary thing. I just want to say one thing to what you said. And, and I think this is a very good point to take away. I think from a company's perspective, like if you want to really enrich your product, AI is really good in, in finding information, 
that you are not aware of, mm -hmm. which you still have to check and kind of, you know, as you said, you know, like you're sending the draft to the lawyer and then they're doing something with it. And that, that has been kind of like my enablement that really works. So for instance, for the email client, I'm using Superhuman, which I also ab I absolutely love it. If AI helps me to find conversations, then I'm all for it. If it helps me to write emails, then I'm not all for it because yeah. my emails are usually like, okay, or no, or right. yeah, let's chat. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I don't need help with that. So let's just go into a very specific topic. And let me just throw you into the cold water here in regards to OKRs. Okay. So let's say we have a company structure and we have exactly this problem. And we say that we want to know whether it makes sense. So we want to do some explorative research. We want to figure out whether AI makes sense in our products. And we have a couple of products and a couple of growth teams where we're going to put one or two of them on it. What kind of outcome-driven goals would you as a leader put in there to kind of explore this? So we have OKRs, we want to be outcome-driven. So how do we formulate this that is open enough and that is giving us still some kind of tangible output after three months or whatever your planning cycle is? Let, let me clarify the question really quick. Are you asking how to set goals for measuring whether we are outcome driven? No. So let's say we have a company that gets hard FOMO because all our competitors are using AI as a feature. I see. And we want to kind of know now, can we put something to our teams that they do now in the next three months to figure out whether it's worth it for us to even start building something or not? Yeah. So the uh, so first thing we have to do is assess the baseline, right? What are people doing today? How successful are they? What's getting in their way? Where are they failing? You know, what are sort of the main concerns in our customer journey that are keeping our customers from being successful and therefore our business from being successful? I think that's number one. I think the other thing we need to understand is what our competitors are doing. We talked about this a minute ago, right? So in the same situation, how are our competitors treating the same workflow issues? The next thing is, okay, great. Based on what, are pe what people are doing today, what do we want to see them doing differently in the future, right? So today there's a four-step process and people are dropping out at step three, okay? We want to see them get through from step three to step four more successfully, right? How much more successfully? 50% more, 90% more, whatever it is, right? Terrific, good. Now we've got a goal, right? We've got a key result. Ideally, that's tied to some kind of an objective that the organization cares about. Now the team can go figure out the most effective combination of code, copy, design, value proposition, pricing model, business model, whatever it is that gets people from step three to step four more successfully. In some cases, maybe that's AI, right? Maybe AI makes that easier for people to move through. Maybe it eliminates the need for step three altogether and we can just hop it, you know? But the foundational principle is what are people doing today? What's getting in their way of doing that more or more successfully? And where would we like them to be when we're done? Right? What, what do we want to see people doing differently when we're done? And then, is it AI? Is it whatever? Is it something else? That, those are the questions to ponder at that point. And you can test all of those things. right? You can test AI without implementing AI. Years ago, when we had our product studio in, in New York City and around the world, it was called Neo, we built a chatbot, a quote-unquote AI chatbot, to give advice to men. That was, it was called Ask Alexis. And the experiment for that was humans, humans who were fielding the requests from our initial beta cohorts and supplying answers to them and seeing how they reacted and what questions they asked and how often those questions were asked. And then we made a decision about whether or not to automate that, right? So there's lots of ways you can test all this stuff before actually implementing it and committing to it in a way that makes killing it a lot more difficult. Yeah, I think you made a lot of good points in there. And I like to conceptually attack this from the point of there needs to be a business case in place before we even start like running for kind of three months. So, you know, which channels are affected? What do we think is going to be the outcomes for the customers, of course? But also if we start to, for instance, add new features, and I'm not just talking about features as deliverables, but also like value that has some kind of keywords that we were not working with, for instance, with SEO or, or whatever our content marketing is, we need to kind of know what is the potential upside if we would execute this at 100% quality, which is never happening. But I would like to know beforehand, before we start building, what if we become the number one on the planet to do this? 
How does this affect our top line and so forth? So I find this always quite interesting. And then I also expect in a kind of business plan, a tiered approach, just as you said, like, is there some way that we can validate this without actually building the feature? I think this is a very, very good point. I would not call humans that are imitating AI and MVP because I feel like too many companies are jumping too fast into MVP development. So I really like this kind of intermediate step where you say like, you know, like we just want to test whether there's any feedback from the market to this, because if nobody's using it, why build it, right? Right. Let me ask you a very specific question. So let's say we have this kind of, this is the plan for Q1. We're going to research this. We know what our competitors are doing and we have some kind of plan. How do you think about classical organizations should they let the teams run for three months, which is a very common kind of planning cycle that they have for the quarter? Should they let them run for three months? Or do you have some kind of sub-processes that you also like to advocate for? Like, are there any check-ins or like, how do you structure this? How would you recommend to structure this if you're, for instance, a sales-led organization that does this for the first time? Yeah. So I think, look, three months is great. It's First of all, it's a quarter. And I, I think it's great because it's less than a year which is how most organizations plan, right? So anything shorter than a year is already a win. So three months is great. Let's start there, okay? So if, if today, if your cycles are a year long, then cutting it down to a quarter gives you four times more opportunities to learn. So you've already quadrupled your learning opportunity. So that's fantastic. That said, I would not, even with that short of a time frame, I would not want a team to disappear for three months and then reappear three months later and just be like, ta-da, we did it, or we failed, right? That's unacceptable to me. I think that there needs to be a series of regular check-ins, whether they are real-time or asynchronous or whatever it is, every couple of weeks, once a month, something that says, hey, this is what we've been doing, this is what we've learned, this is the progress that we're making, and based on all of that, here are the changes that we're making in our plan to move forward. Right? Because even with a shorter time cycle of three months versus a year, right, a team may learn within four weeks or even six weeks that the thing that they're working on doesn't make sense anymore. Right? So why spend another six weeks? Because the check-in is six weeks away. Raise your hand right now. Come see the team. Come see the stakeholders and say, look, I know we planned a 12-week cycle on this. We're six weeks in. Nothing we're doing is moving the needle here. Okay. And we think it's because of X or because of Y or because of Z, and we should pivot to one of those things. And here's our recommendation. I would love, and me, if I was a stakeholder in that situation, I would love to hear that because you just saved me six weeks worth of effort and time and money and whatever it is, right? That we would have thrown away because I gave you 12 weeks, right? And I think we need to create the kinds of organizations where teams feel comfortable coming to their leaders, coming to their stakeholders and saying, I know you gave us 12 weeks. This isn't happening. We got to try something else. And here's what we recommend, right? It's not like, it's not happening. Figure it out, boss. It's like the data says X. And so we think we should pivot towards X. Yeah. I really love this. You took away like two out of my three points that I wanted to contend on this. So this was a very thorough answer. <laughs> I think it's, the concept that I like to think about this is, is that, so like every three months, of course, you have your kind of, the new planning is coming up, you know, like the OKRs are going around all of this. But in between there, I like to do it on a monthly cadence where I just, we call these also check-in meetings, right? Yeah. Typical check-in meetings where you have three questions to answers. What have we learned? Are we still on track or do we also change or do we need to change our commitments? Yeah. And I'm a big, big fan of allowing people and teams to also change their goals during the quarter. If it's necessary, it should not be the goal, of course, right? But like, if it's necessary, then you should change it. So you said something really important. I think what I see a lot of companies struggling with, and this goes normally, unfortunately, more into the sales-led driven ones, is that they are fostering a culture of bullshit dressing up the bride. So when you come into these check-in meetings, the teams are... They're putting a lot of energy into making results sound good. Yeah. It's almost like they forget about everything that good planning is about. And then they say, like, look at what we all shipped. But like, let's say even if they go for the numbers, they're trying to cherry pick the numbers that make them look good. And 
it is a very difficult challenge for a lot of these companies to kind of really deploy this culture that you just mentioned, where we do not punish bad, like bad performance, because that's not what it should be about. We should be ambitious in our goals and we should be moving somewhere that is bringing the business forward. But there is a difficult question on how do you reward learnings while still pushing towards something that moves the needle? And I haven't found the perfect answer for it, but if you do not facilitate in these meetings exactly what you said, which is we're in this together and we're a team, you're not reporting to management at this point, you're actually reporting to someone that can help you unblock yourself, then that's what this should be about. So let me ask you a very specific question because I'm not 100% sure yet how I'm going to answer it myself. We should celebrate people if they reach good things. That much is clear. Yep. How do we treat this in a company where we say now learnings are more important than having the success afterwards, because success is a result of learning? How do we treat this in a company where maybe there is a team that has just been failing all the time, but they did everything right? Yeah. Learning, everything was on point, but there was not that much to celebrate. How do you handle this? I have a couple of thoughts here. So first, look, as a stakeholder, I would be infinitely more pissed off If you came to me after six months and said, we failed, right? Because it took you six months to figure that out or to come to me with that information. I would be infinitely happier if you showed up after six weeks or six days and said, this is the wrong thing to chase. So that's number one. So we've got to figure out, first of all, how to get that mindset into our leaders because they don't have that mindset. They don't. They have this idea that we need to drive teams to productivity to production goals, and that's going to be how we succeed. So I think that's that's the first challenge here. I think the second challenge here is this idea of the team that is continuously failing. A team should not be continuously failing. And what I mean by that is, let's say they, they've got an OKR to hit, they've got a hypothesis, they started running some experiments, the experiments aren't working, but they've learned some things and they try something else. And so now they've run experiments again. Now we're four weeks in, they've run a couple of experiments and they're still not figuring it out. Six weeks, they're running a a third set of experiments and they still can't solve the problem. We've got to pause, right? That team, something's, something's broken there, right? And that could be a variety of things. That could be the team is chasing the wrong problem. The team perhaps hasn't come up with the right solution yet. The team could be simply bad at product discovery and experimentation and learning, or this is just the dead end and we need to try something else. But if the team is incentivized, number one, and also fears, is incentivized to ship something to solve the problem and fears not solving the problem, they are not going to come to you with that data. They're going to be afraid, frankly, to raise their hand and say, look, we can't figure this out, right? Help us, okay? right? But we've tried this, we've tried this, we've tried this. No matter what we put out there, it's just not moving the needle. We need to go back to to step one or whatever it is. It needs to be celebrated. I agree with you, right? But like continuous failure, something's broken there, right? One, like either the, the team isn't doing a good job, which is worth exploring. Do you not know how to do experimentation learning? We're chasing the wrong problem. We're chasing the wrong goals. We're chasing the wrong customers. Maybe we have just bad ideas. It's also possible, right? But something's broken there and that shouldn't persist. And so without those check-ins that we talked about a few minutes ago, right? Without those check-ins, I as the stakeholder have no idea that that's happening. And I need you to tell me that so that I can intervene when it makes sense and say, look, folks, we have to fix something here. Let's, Let's figure this out together, right? Because again, if you go six months or even three months, right? Continuously failing, Something's broke. Like we've we've messed up. We've wasted time. No, I think I agree with this to eighty percent. But there is a condition where this actually does not mean that the team is actually broken. And I can talk about this because I always called myself an innovation PM, and I had also some very ambitious teams that were always aiming for moonshots. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a very important lesson in there. So what you just said applies to ninety percent of most of the teams. And I think. There is a special condition sometimes in in specifically high growth startups that are trying to, you know, like push the boundaries a little bit more, right? Like they're not having 20, 30 million under themselves in terms of the revenue that they're affecting. And I think that is, if you have a team 
that is evaluating moonshots. So like it's extremely innovative and it just like goes for these high risk estimations, then the likelihood that you're going to succeed is very, very low from the onset. And that's fine, right? Like there's not a problem with this. I do tell people though, specifically leaders, if you are putting teams onto this, you have to make sure that this does not go longer than two quarters, I would say. So you need to balance optimization bets, which have a much, much higher chance of succeeding rather than just like piling on innovation after innovation after innovation, because it really grinds you down as a team if you do not have some kind of success within these six months. And one good kind of antidote or like in regards to how long this kind of time frame can be that you're doing this in is the base seniority that you put into this team. So a team full of juniors should not do any OKR where they are just evaluating things that can actually fail because senior teams understand that the validation of an idea, even if the idea fails, in itself is already a success. Mm -hmm. But you can only do this for a kind of set period of time, I would say. Yeah, I think yeah. That's, look, I think that's fair critique, right? And I think that you're right. Like we need to qualify the team as an innovation team. And I think in that situation, right, if the mission is innovation, then no. repeated failure is perfectly okay, right? There's that that legendary uh, Nordstrom sunglasses video. I don't know if you know it. Like I used to use it for teaching all the time where the Nordstrom Innovation Lab went out into it. Nordstrom's a big American department store. And they went, went out to the department store to test a sunglass, trying, uh, trying out sunglasses with an iPad app. It's probably 10 years old at this point. When that team was in existence, their mission, their stated mission was to fail 80% of the time because they were an innovation team, right? No. But not every team and most teams probably should not be innovation teams, right? And so, but you're right. In innovation cases, that's the recipe. I really like this because if your goal is to fail, that means if you're not failing enough, that you're not being ambitious enough. Right, you're not so, trying hard enough. Exactly. Yeah, you're not <laughs> try harder. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, I really, really like this. So what are the most common ways to just completely fuck it up completely, right? So like, let's say we have, we're product leaders, all of us, every, our organization is perfect, of course, because nobody's organization is at fault in any way. What are the most common, maybe unintuitive ways on messing this kind of step up? So like, let's say we understand all of this in principle, it's not about whether you understand the concept of OKRs and so forth. Like, where does the failure start to creep in into organizations. I know you're also writing a book about, uh, you know, OKRs as a general framework. So how can we make this sustainable? And what are the typical failure points that happen on an organizational level? Uh, look, at the organization level, the failure starts from a lack of humility. And I think it starts at the top. And this is particularly true in high growth startups, in scale-ups, in founder-led companies. It's, it's true in every company, let's be honest, right? But it's a lack of humility, right? So the people who either founded the company or running the company today got there for a particular reason, right? They're smart, they're visionaries, they're innovative, that type of thing. And they want to prescribe work for their teams. Okay, but if you allow your teams to do this learning work, if you set goals in terms of changes in human behaviors, in terms of outcomes, and the team comes back to you and says, hey boss, the thing that you prescribed isn't changing behavior in the way that we hoped and we need to pivot, you need to accept that right? The breakdown begins right there and then. If you're a leader in a position and, and you are going to prescribe work to your teams, then you need to be willing to accept the reality that you're going to be wrong. And your team needs to feel comfortable telling you that. That's where this breaks down. Because what ends up happening in 95% of the cases is cases where a, where a team is working towards outcomes and gets work prescribed for them, right? When they come back with evidence that contradicts the boss's opinion, the bosses will just build it anyway, right? At which point you've completely gutted any value of any kind of, of customer centricity, objectives and key results, organizational agility, all that stuff goes out the window. If we're just going to do what you say anyway, why did we waste time even doing all that other stuff, right? That's where this stuff starts to break down. Like so as a leader, You've got to put yourself in a position where you have strong opinions. That's perfectly okay. But those opinions need to be 
loosely held, right? So I learned this phrase from Janice Frazier many, many years ago, strong opinions loosely held, right? That's yep. your job as a leader. Yes, you have the experience. Yes, you have the vision. You have the expertise. Terrific. I want to hear your strong opinion. But if I come back to you with data that says your strong opinion was wrong, you have to accept that. And we got to figure out where to go from there. I think that's a very, very good point because usually, and I also love how you frame this in regards to humility. And I want to, I want to say something to this just in a second, but I think that when business leaders have very strongly held opinions, and I have this conversation often with them, and they would love to have this idea manifested in the product and the growth teams, but the growth teams just, they do not agree with it, right? Mm -hmm. So like, it's just not coming. And sometimes you don't have objective data, right? Like we also have this unfortunate situation that not always can we say, you know, like data gives us a clear answer. Then they kind of, they bring the idea up more and more and more, you know, like in like a soft kind of pushy way until it actually gets pushed through into the backlogs. And I think I usually then start to have a very frank conversation where I'm just like, if you do not have the processes that are manifesting this particular idea, then the two things are actually true. One of them is either your idea is shit or it's what you said, you are not taking accountability for the processes that you have put in place. So something has to give. And I really love this in the way that you said it. I think I call it more accountability rather than humility, because if you have this kind of itch, that something is wrong in your company as a CEO and you use phrases like people are just not outcome driven enough or whatever, that's a you problem, my friend. Yeah. And I wanted to read back something to you like really quickly because I saw this today pop up in my LinkedIn feed. So Spotify just let go a lot of people mm -hmm. and their CEO dropped a truth bomb, apparently calling a lot of fake work and amateur XX in an internal memo. And I don't know Daniel Ek personally, but this sounds like a you problem. Yeah. You know, this sounds like a you problem. This is really weird to me how a lot of executives still think that what's happening in their organization is not their own fault. And I try to be empathetic, you know, in the sense of like, why does something like this happen? Because they're frustrated, right? Like they feel like, ah, you know, they're never doing what I do and so forth. But the first step is exactly what you said. It's humility. Yeah. You need to kind of understand, hey, it's my problem. I could not build an organization that actually does it in this way. It's not easy to build an organization that is big, but like this is such yeah. a good point. So I love this framing around humility. The, the irony here, of course, is that so many companies uh, ha have and continue to attempt to emulate the Spotify model, right? Like that's become such a default thing, by the way, which, which is kind of funny, but you're right. I mean, the, accountability is interesting, right? And I'll tell you why, and, and I may steal that word to, to, because humility it's rare and it doesn't resonate well with executives because I think it's misunderstood. I think, I think people think that humility is the abdication of vision, right? It's the abdication of leadership. It's the sort of like, well, I'll let the, you know, the laissez-faire, like I'll let the teams figure it out. That's not humility, right? Humility is just simply being able to admit when you were wrong, right? It's taking accountability. So maybe, maybe accountability is a, that feels like more of a businessy thing that, that executives will, will take on more willingly than to be more humble. So I think there's a very good point to double click on. I feel like, let's say we agree. So someone says, yes, okay, we have this problem. So what should I do about this layout? Because I had this conversation as well. And then it's always like difficult. Okay, so like, what should you do now about it? So like, we all agree we should... Use the flowers, not the guns in the, in, the, um, in the organization. We should be more, we should be practicing more humility. And I think it often comes down to a very practical kind of way, and that is through incentives, right? So a very good example is sales organizations or like sales organization within organizations. And what I love about this so much is that if you think about rewarding your salespeople to get a specific cut of the amount of signatures that they're getting for the product. Or, you know, like, hey, you know, like we want to sell Jeff 500 licenses, even though he's a solopreneur. But that's going to be, you know, if you give sales money to oversell your customer, then they will do that. Yeah. And this is also how it works in your company. If you start to punish directors for practicing humility, right? Like setting realistic goals, not scoreboards that are kind of looking good towards the investors, but don't do anything for the customers or like the top line revenue, then that's kind of on you. But that's exactly how this is. So I am a firm believer that you can steer everything through your incentives. 
in that sense. And I, I don't mean monetary incentives, right? Like this is really about how you show up, how honest you are also towards the customer and it's also like to your own employees to you you now stay in front of everyone and say like, guys, we have fucked up mm -hmm. and that's okay. Yeah. But calling the things by its name and just also practice, as you said, humility in a sense that, hey, I'm the CEO. I should know this. This should not have happened, but it's my fault because that also means then then others also below you will start to take accountability. And I think this is a very underappreciated fact about outcome-driven planning because without it, it just does not work. There's so, and, and honestly, like executives need to say so little, like they shouldn't, they should say more, but I'll just tell you a quick story. I was coaching the executive team of a big American bank as the mm. bank was undergoing a multi-year agile transformation. And essentially we were working with the executive team who were all fantastic banking executives but none of them were software executives. Like they, they didn't come from any kind of technical background. And so they knew how to run a bank, but they didn't know how to run a software company. And they were a software company at this point that, that operated in the financial services space. And so we spent six months with them, coaching them about what it means to, to run an agile software organization that operates in the financial services world. And after a few months of this, we had one, we had one coaching meeting with, with the team and the president immediately following our coaching session, had a meeting with his direct reports. It was like 150 EVPs and SVPs or whatever it is in the bank. And he said three words to that organization. After coming out of our meeting, he said, he said, agile is hard. And our email and our text messages just started blowing up like, oh my God, you reached him. He gets us. He understands us, right? Finally, finally, he understands what we've been going through right? He literally said three words. And those three words were agile is hard, right? And it's like that tiny speck of humility and accountability, whatever you want to call it, triggered such a visceral and tangible response in all of his direct reports, right? Imagine if he had said six words or 10 words, right? What that would have been like. But that's, that's all it takes is an admission that this stuff is hard, that it's unpredictable, it's complex, we're going to make mistakes. Let's figure that out sooner rather than later so that we don't build too much or hire too much or, or sell too much, right? Or incentivize in the wrong way and course correct, right? Course correction based on evidence is the goal, right? That's agility. And if we can build that mindset into our organization, we will win. I think you said something very clever there that I really like. It's, it's oftentimes leaders understand what's wrong in an organization, but they don't really want to accept it because it's outside of their own domain knowledge. So I see this specifically, like if someone is not a technical leader, then they think like, yeah, but it cannot be that hard to publish something, right? Like I have a red button at home when I do my WordPress site or something like this. And I think this is at the heart of why humility is so difficult, specifically for a very specific set of people. Just because you know what's going on in your own domain does not mean that you know what's going on in the other. And if you are not a technical leader and you do not believe your engineering organization that something is difficult, for instance, then again, that's a you problem. Yeah. You either have hired people that you should not trust or you do not trust people that you should trust. And in either way, it's kind of like your problem. I, re I really like this. I really like this. That's a good anecdote. I will totally steal it. Okay. No, it's good. No, 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 Dude. it's fine. <laughs> Jeff, we've been going for 45 minutes and this has been a really awesome conversation. Let me ask you something more, more broadly before we close this. And that is, are there any trends aside from AI? And I believe that you're not going to mention AI, but are there any trends that you're betting on that you are excited about that are coming up in the next five to 10 years that you think like, yeah, that's the thing that's going to happen and I cannot wait for it? I, I've recently been exposed to a couple of incubators and funds and founders and wealthy individuals who are supporting this and they're supporting sustainable and impactful startups. So they're funding organizations that are deliberately trying to make a positive difference in the world, whether it's environmental or humanitarian or, or whatever it is, right? And it feels to me anecdotally at the moment that there's a lot of momentum and a lot of money behind this. And just seeing sort of like where my kids' heads are at. So I've got a 20-year-old and I've got a 17-year-old. 
and they, you know, they're looking at the, at the world and they're seeing a lot of problems and they're motivated to fix it because they have to live in it a lot longer than us, right? And so I think the combination of environmentally and humanitarily minded younger folks coming up and money to support those folks in their initiatives and in their startups, et cetera, I feel like that's going to have a big impact in the world in, in five to 10 years. Yeah, I think I went through my phase of being angry at young people about five to 10 years ago. Huh. And since I've turned 40, I started also to kind of go on the same train as you. I feel more and more hopeful because of the idealism that I also see. Yeah. And I did not recognize it, right? Like I always kind of wrote it off as being annoying, but actually they really want to better the world. Whether they have the right approach or not, I mean, that's besides the point, but I feel like oftentimes you need to have the heart to start. And uh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. So Jeff, how can people get in touch with you? Should they get in touch with you? And if so, where should they do that? You should definitely get in touch with me. I am super easy to find. That's by design. So LinkedIn, a great place to connect. Connect with me there, as well as my website, jeffgodhealth.com. There's a blog there. There's a newsletter there. Uh, there's a way to contact me there. If I can help your organization, terrific. If you want to find out about the books that I've written or the OKR book that we're writing, it's okr-book.com. But everything's on jeffgodhealth.com. That's a great place to start. Amazing. I will put it in the show notes. And thank you so much for this conversation. This was a lot of fun. My pleasure, Leah. Thanks so much for having me. That's it. Ba-boom. Thank you so much for listening to The Product Tea with Leah. If you don't have enough yet, you can subscribe to my podcast right now at Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or you can head to my website, leahtharin.com, which is L-E-A-H-T-H-A-R-I-N.com, where you can find much more of my material or just want to work with me. 